Hello everyone, good evening. Thank you for joining with me. I am Vaishnav Achat from Texas Instruments and today I would like to talk to you about a proposal for a remote processor framework in Sapphire Atos. I work with the Linux team at Texas Instruments and primarily working on Linux and U-Boot for TI processors. TI is a part of multiple open source organizations including Sapphire Atos uh, and we focus on upstream and open source ecosystem in our device definition phase itself. So as part of my day job, I work primarily with Linux and U-Boot on TI devices. I am also the maintainer for TI platforms in Sapphire Atos. So here are a few disclaimers. So this is just a work in progress proposal and get to get the community feedback on the proposal for a remote processor framework, why we thought we need a framework in Sapphire Atos. And this is not a complete implementation and we'll be working on a RFC and the standard process for introducing the subsystem once we gain sufficient feedback from the community. Okay, this is how the talk is uh, being spread out. So first we'll go through what is remote processors, then why it might, the motivation of why it might be useful to have a remote, remote processor subsystem in Sephir Atos. And we'll also discuss on existing ways of managing remote processors in Linux and U-Boot and how that, that does not cover all the system level use cases. Then we can discuss on how we can introduce a, a remote, pro, remote processor framework in Sapphire, both in client and also in host mode, which we'll discuss in detail more. And also we'll have the benefits of having something like this and future plans, what, what we are working towards. Okay, what is a remote processor? So unlike traditional microcontrollers and microprocessors, where there was a single CPU core or multiple CPU cores of the same type working in SMP or symmetric multiprocessing mode. Today's processors are very complex and having have a heterogeneous architecture with the same SOC, having multiple application cores, multiple real-time MCU cores, then multiple low-power MCU cores, and sometimes system controller cores, DSPs, and so on. So remote processors are those processors in the system which is managed by the host. So it's, uh, we kind of think like it's always the application processor or the biggest processor in the system as the host. It's not necessarily true that the biggest processor, maybe the application processor running Linux is always the host. So for example, if you take the case of a bootloader, which boots up multiple uh, cores in an AMP system. So you can think of the uh, bootloader as a host, which boots up all these remote processors, uh, others. So, Let's say in case of our devices, we have a startup core, a Cortex R5, which boots up the Cortex A53 or uh, A72 cores. So in, in that case, we can think of that Cortex A core as a remote core with respect to the bootloader. When you come to Linux and you work with, a, like maybe you have a DSP uh, accelerator core or you have a real-time uh, MCU core, then those cores which you manage from Linux are the remote cores when you, when you look from that perspective. And today there is a very mature framework in Linux and U-Boot for the management of remote processor cores. So from Linux or U-Boot, you can start, stop, load the firmware, uh, shut down, or even attach to a running cores and all, do all those kind of functionalities. And Linux also has some advanced features like you can start a communication channel through the standard RP message framework and also uh, uh, then uh, uh, do some advanced features through the RP message Vertio drivers. So for the discussion, in this discussion, we'll be having some implementations or demos. So we have taken a TI AM62 uh, platform as a reference and this has a uh, application processor Cortex A50, Cort Core Cortex A53, and uh, and remote MCU the uh, a Cortex M4F. So traditionally we use systems where we just boot up the M4 from U-Boot or from Linux. But in the end of the system, you will see how we have able to get uh, both of this uh, course running uh, Sephir, and how we boot up the remote boot and load the remote processor from Sephir. So you might have a doubt why even use Sephir on application processors. So those are designed with an MMU and the complex pipeline to run Linux uh, or a high level OS. And while in most cases Linux is the popular choice for running 
uh, on application uh, processor due to the versatility, Zephyr Autos can also be a good choice to you can run on the application code because Zephyr supports uh, SMB symmetric multiprocessing support on Cortex A, the 64 bit ARM cores, then gives you real time performance. Then there are complex subsystems like networking, graphics subsystem, display, USB, everything, which you might not get from some of the traditional. Uh, uh, Atos, uh, uh, where you don't, you might not even have a device driver model and all. Then Zephyr also have some features like power management, which might be suitable for. So it's kind of sits in a sweet spot where you don't want the complexity of Linux, but you want a lot of features that Linux also offers. And also, it's much simpler to configure and develop than Linux, and it, uh, you have a much smaller application size. So you will you, most of the times everyone prefers to run uh, Linux on a high level OS and on the application cores, but on some systems you might need deterministic behavior or real time behavior, and you need to switch to the preempt RT or the real time Linux kernel. The real time Linux provides the versatility and rich ecosystem that Linux provides, along with the real time deterministic behavior. But Linux and real-time Linux are much more complex and you have multiple tuning knobs that you need to configure properly for your system to get the actual deterministic performance. Zephyr is much simpler and even though it's not as versatile as Linux, it provides a necessary subsystem like we discussed to implement complex use cases like networking, uh, graphics, display, USB and all. And uh, also, if you look at uh, Linux or real-time Linux, the, the device drivers that's being used in real-time Linux is the exactly same as what you have for the vanilla Linux. So you might not have a thought of the a, a proper real-time implementation for your device drivers. So even though you adjust all the tuning knobs for real-time Linux and uh, perform all the optimizations, if you have not implemented the device drivers properly in Linux, you won't get the deterministic performance. Uh, so, but if you look at Zephyr, you will have the mindset that it's an Artos and you are implementing the device driver with, to behave in a deterministic manner. So we have had uh, previous debugs and issues where we did not get the proper real-time deterministic performance from the device driver. So the, the, the kernel, the scheduler, everything provides you the real-time performance. Sometimes you might not get the determines them from the device drivers because you did not implement the device drivers for a real-time system. You just implemented for the normal Linux. But that's not the case with Zephyr, but you develop with an Artos mindset and you, in, from the day one, you have to, uh, you have, uh, you will be implementing that in a way that you have the real-time performance for the device drivers. And now, with, so, so that why Zephyr can also be uh, used in application cores. Now, why even have a remote processor subsystem in Zephyr? Why not boot up all the remote cores from bootloader? So we saw that U-Boot supports. So why not boot up all the DSPs and all the remote cores from bootloader and just forget about it? So that's where, so U-Boot has a very good subsystem where you can uh, load the remote cores, uh, even boot up Linux, the DSPs, everything. But for some use cases, you cannot just have the remote cores uh, booted up initially and just forget about it. For example, you want, you want to do power management. So the system is choose to suspend when there is no activity. And when it resumes, you need to resume the remote processes also. But consider the case where you don't have Linux in the uh, scenario. So you have uh, software running on your complete system, software running on the host processor and software running on, uh, software or maybe another Atos running on your remote processors. Then what happens is when you resume, you don't have a proper management framework to start up these remote cores and load the firmwares. But uh, maybe just do a plain startup from U-Boot, you have the necessary framework over there. And power management is very important uh, feature that you will need to implement in most of the production use cases. And in, in this case, if remote, uh, the Linux was the host uh, operating system, then you can have the, there is already a mature remote work subsystem and during resume, you can uh, choose to reinitialize and reload the firmware and start up the remote cores. So coming to the motivation, so we always see Linux or real-time Linux in use cases. So we are looking at a hypothetical use case where we have application core running software and you have a high resolution display with multi-point touch which needs to provide a rich uh, 
uh, HMI interface. Uh, then you can you can have networking and communication protocols like Ethernet and CAN, and then you can have separate remote processor cores running Sapphire, uh, doing some real time tasks like motor control. You can have DSPs running workloads, so you can capture images on maybe a factory line and do analysis on a conveyor and do things like that. So traditionally, uh, uh, due to this is uh, something uh, like a remote processor subsystem is not available. You can maybe do uh, some of the features and implement this with Sapphire, but uh, uh, even though Sapphire sub provides the subsystem, we find some difficulties in getting this implemented. And also, Sephira has a very rich networking and the communication protocol stack, and we can we get the sweet spot between Linux and the traditional Atos, where uh, you don't have those rich frameworks, and but uh, you don't need to go to Linux for the complexity. So now, we kind of understand why or the motivation behind uh, why we need the remote process subsystem. So let's take a look at uh, uh, the Linux remote processor subsystem to gain some inspiration and how we can take the implementation uh, as a reference. So Linux has a very uh, mature remote processor framework starting maybe 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and it uh, allows it's a host implementation which allows you to power on load firmware stop the uh, remote processors and the framework is there so that you can abstract the hardware level differences so one maybe uh, a one hardware uh, the soc vendors uh, way of starting the remote processes might not be the same for the other soc vendor so you need to abstract away and give the common helper functions which the different uh, soc vendors can implement in their particular drivers and in addition, the Linux uh, remote work framework is very com complex and has some very complex features like the RP message Vertio devices, where uh, you have a standard transport and platform specific remote work drivers only need to provide some low level handlers and the RP message uh, drivers will just work. So for example, there are things like RP message TTY and all like which gives you an RP message uh, UART over the RP message transport. So it will just work uh, if you have the proper uh, entries and handlers in your firmware. You don't need to do any plumbing in the Linux kernel to get this working. So you just need to advertise in your firmware. So the subsystem is just split into, so there are core functionalities like starting, stopping, and preparing the process. So we'll discuss on each of these functions in detail so that we can take inspiration from this and implement similar ones in Sapphire. And there is an, also an ELF loader, so we need a cross-architectural ELF loader. So these, in these heterogeneous systems, you have maybe one of the, uh, the cores as the host and the other uh, cores where you need to load the firmware might not be of the same architecture. It might be a different architecture. So there, there are Vertio helpers and the character device implementation. Those we won't go into deep because that's not relevant to uh, if we want to implement it in Sapphire. So what's the minimum thing that you need to have in your remote processor client firmware to have it uh, uh, loaded and processed by your remote processor host? So the standards are governed by the OpenAMP project and there is something important called the resource table that the uh, client firmware needs to advertise or, or provide it in the ELF binary. So it needs the client firmware needs to have a section called resource table in the predetermined format which the, that standard is governed by OpenAM. And so this is how the resource table looks like. So the resource table has a header where uh, we have fields like the version and the number of resource, resource entries. And we, each resource entry is also a structure where you have a, each uh, resource entry has a header which uh, determines the type and the depending on the type it might have the contents. So what's, what are resource entries? So resource entries are sometimes just telling the host that okay we have these capabilities. Sometimes we want to negotiate and get something from the host. For example, if you just start up uh, a remote processor client firmware, you need to uh, sometimes ask for some carve out regions in the DDR, which the host is managing. The host can allocate this region for this particular remote processor and share the address and the size of the region 
uh, as a response. So the client advertises or, or asks what it needs uh, through the resource uh, table structure. And this is how it's laid out. We, we have a res common resource table header and each entry has a header which has its type and uh, data. And depending on the uh, type, we are passing the uh, contents of the resource table. Now we are going to look at what are all the operations or the API that the remote processor subsystem in Linux implements. So first one is the remote processor operation prepare. So you need to load firmware and start a processor to run. But to load firmware on a processor, you might need to maybe do some initialization before even starting to load. Think of it as switching on the processor. So if you have a, a, a heterogeneous processor and your process, the remote core might have SRAMs or uh, TCMs or local memories that you need to power on this so, and also to pro, uh, avoid leakage, you, you don't power on anything in a uh, multi-core SOC if you're not using it. So you need to power on this core and those regions that you need to load the firmware first before loading the firmware. So this is kind of a step uh, as a pre requisite before loading the firmware. So this will be called before start loading the firmware and uh, before starting uh, to run the code. So this is how you implement it. So sometimes you might even need to just the set the TCM or SRAM to zero. You need to do a mem set and clear the stray values in the memory. So that's what the prepare function does. So now the, the one of the most complex functions is the load function. So you have a uh, elf binary that you need to load and the elf will have different sections that you need to load to different parts of the memory. Sometimes these sections could be in the DDR. Sometimes it could be in the TCM or the internal SRAM or the IRAM and it could be different sections. The complexity arises when you are loading it from a different processor and both of the processors might not have a same view of your system. So if you if you look at a standard ELF loader, you just read this uh, pro section headers, ELF header and section headers, pass through the section and just do a mem copy and load it. But if you want to load to a remote processor of a completely different architecture and it might have a different view of the the complete SOC memory map. So the address 8000, what the host sees might not be same as what the, maybe it might be the zero uh, address zero for the uh, remote core. So that's where you need to have, you need to have a custom implementation of something called DA to VA. So that's the device address to kernel virtual address. For take, for take for an example, your device, the remote core has an TCM or SRAM which has the address zero uh, or uh, for an example. Now, if you look from a, a host, which is an another processor, your SOC will have a TRM where you will see the memory map. So this uh, TCM or SRAM might have a different address uh, when the other host client processor sees. So the DA to VA is the mapping that you provides uh, to map from the uh, uh, the, the host's view from the uh, device view because the ELF sections will have the device view uh, implemented in there. And then also there will be DDR sections. You might need to, to load it in the DDR section so that you just map and return the address. So once now you have, so you looked at load and load had a dependency, you need to have a translation. Now you have loaded the firmware in the expected regions that the core expects. Now you just need to uh, start the processor. Now this also is depend, uh, it's very uh, specific to your uh, uh, the vendor's implementation of the process. Sometimes it's just releasing the reset. Now if you go into deep how the releasing of reset, some uh, devices it might be writing to a re register to release the reset. Sometimes heterogeneous processors have a system controller which manages all these things and you send a message to the system controller and that does uh, release of the reset. So that uh, a central entity controls the uh, re re uh, the power, turning of the power and uh, reset of the entities in the SOC. So you do your uh, uh, SOC specific, uh, the core specific, specific implementation, in implementation in your start function. Now you have started up the core and you need to stop uh, the core. So, uh, so, uh, so here also you, you will, your SOC will have specific implementations where you need to follow. So let's say 
I was talking only about the remote cores being a single core. Sometimes it can be a cluster of multiple cores, and you might need to do some sequencing when you need to power power off or uh, releasing the processor. So you implement all this during in this function. And now you are we are coming in a symmetric manner. We prepared, we started, we loaded, the, we load the firmware, start, then we stop and. Unprepare is just a symmetric version of prepare, where you release the resources and power down the processor. So now we have discussed on how the host implementation of remote processor is in Linux. But Linux cannot ever be a remote processor client. Usually it's always only the host that manages the uh, other remote processors. But if you look at Sapphire, it runs on Cortex a big application cores to smaller Cortex M microkernel cores. So it can be both a host and a client. So we are just discussing about the client interface. Sapphire already supports this, so uh, we can have uh, the firmware compiled with resource table and load it to a uh, remote processor. It, it's all uh, uh, using the helpers from the OpenM library. There are already implementations, so there are platforms reusing it and one of the platforms I took for the demo is also implementing something like this. But uh, we are, uh, since we don't have a framework, we are duplicating some of the code and uh, each platform is implementing on their own implementation. For example, I just did a grep of resource table, how uh, different platforms are packing the resource table to their images. So, so if you look at seven or eight platforms there, they're all packing the resource table and having uh, their own implementation where the resource table is a standard uh, entity that's uh, governed by the OpenAM standards and you don't need any specific implementation for your platform. So you could just have a common linker include uh, and things like that to make this process efficient. Sephir already supports the client mode, but uh, we want to have some advanced features. So you have, uh, we discussed about uh, the system suspending. So you cannot sometimes abruptly stop a running remote core. So the remote core might have, it might be holding resources on your heterogeneous system. And if before you stop the core, you need to have some negotiation and let the uh, remote core properly release all the resources it has requested and then properly do a shutdown. That's called the graceful shutdown feature, which we have to implement on not on Sephir, on one of the other artosers. Uh, for our customers and uh, in our SDKs. But if we had a standard framework, we could use that framework to you combine with the device driver model in Sapphire and do a cleanup before doing a shutdown. So Sapphire, since it has a device driver model, it's very easy to hook something like this to the uh, existing helpers in Sapphire. And also now, uh, even though there are some uh, implementations using uh, Sapphire as a remote processor client, uh, we need to have some implementations where, so we discuss the resource table. So the client can request resources and uh, entities from the host and get those as a response and do the uh, implementation. We don't. We have some implementation like RP remote proc TTY and all, but we could improve that implementations to have advanced features like memory car votes, which is very important when you are working with DSPs. So you need to have uh, memory car votes to do the processing and do the uh, inter-processor communication. So right now what we are doing is a static allocation. We have a static uh, we car word memories we are statically allocating we are not negotiating with the host uh, now the host can be Linux or uh, uh, uh but uh, in Linux also the ho the host has the uh, ability to uh, do something like that and Sefer also can do that but we don't have a common reference or example or the framework does not support it so now we looked at the host and client implementation so I have uh, try to implement something like a remote processor host implementation. So this will uh, just expose some API functions. So we discussed on how it was implemented in uh, Linux. So again, this is uh, not the version I might be putting in the pull request, so we are just looking to get feedback and get to uh, some proof of concept that's working. Uh, so we are just implementing the host implementation where you have prepare, unprepare, then the start, the load, and the device address to virtual address conversion. So if you look, look at prepare, so I'm taking a, a TA processor as an example. So I'm taking the A53 application 
cluster running Sapphire in SMP mode as an example uh, as the host and the M4 MCU as a client. So I, if for prepare, so this device has something called a central system controller to which you send messages to tell you need to turn on this power domain. So you, you don't have your host going and writing registers to power on or power on things. You just send messages to the common entity so that you have a common entity that manages all the resources, power, clocks, everything in the system. So that's what, we, so if you look at prepare, what I'm doing is I'm uh, turning on the device power domain because I need to write to the internal SRAMs of the core. And also I am holding the device in reset so that whenever I load the firmware, I don't want it to be in a running state. And in start, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, uh, sending the message to the system controller to release the device from reset. And in unprepare, we are just going the reverse. We are turning off the device. Now coming to the complex part of the ELF loader. So I was looking at uh, how we can process ELFs in uh, in Sapphire. So I looked at it and I saw that there was already an implementation using the LLEXT implementation where it, they're already using the ELF headers and there are uh, some helpers that we can reuse. So there is also another place where you have ELF helpers in Sapphire that's from the OpenAMP library. Uh, so I'm not using it from the OpenAM li library now. I'm using it's the in pre the LLEXT version. So if you look at the L how the ELF loader is implemented, I'm not sure if it's visible. So if you just do a sanity check of the ELF and you iterate through the sections and you try to mem copy and load the different uh, sections of the image. And sometimes you might also need to clear the uh, some of the sections that are not filled uh, full does not have full contents. Now, when you want to load it, you need to have a device address to virtual address translation because your host view of the system memory might not be what is in your client's or the remote course view, which is what the ELF is having. So this is the implementation I have now. So just summarizing, we have the remote host, which allows you to boot and interact with other course running firmware with a resource table. And the host support is exactly similar to what you see in Linux or Ubuntu. Linux has a much advanced implementation, but we are just focusing on uh, uh, just booting up the course and stopping the course. Uh, and client mode, there is already supports, but we think we can improve uh, using the helpers provided by the OpenAM libraries to have more things like the uh, negotiating for car word memories, doing graceful shutdowns and things like that. And also the client firm, we saw that every platform is just duplicating the linger commands. We could have had a common linger command. So things like that is what we wanted to optimize using the client framework. So now coming back to, we discussed some why the motivation behind introducing the framework in Sapphire. So MC boot is, has a Sapphire port and it could, if we have a remote processor framework, you, it can reuse the same drivers and you can have it as a standard open source, very lightweight bootloader for AMP systems. So if you look at some of the DASDK offerings, we have some Atos based bootloaders where it's not based on Sapphire unfortunately, but it can even boot up all the remote cores and uh, uh, it can even boot up Linux uh, running on an application core. So there is actual need for a uh, lightweight bootloader which can do a very fast startup. U-Boot has a lot of sequential phases which uh, steals a lot of your boot time, which sometimes you can uh, cannot afford on uh, some of the production systems. And also like in introducing the framework is not to duplicate the uh, host and client mode implementation so that each vendor can add their own implementation without duplicating it. And also you, we can enable applications with different kinds of cores working together and running Sephir at the same time. Before it was just Linux and Sephir running on some of the cores, maybe we can even have Sephir running on all of the cores. So I have some demo, I have running it running on M62X EVM. So we told that it has an application processor, A53 cluster, and also a M4 MC cluster. So today what we can do is we can load firmware on it from the remote core from U-Boot. So I'll just show what we are uh, doing from U-Boot. I'm hoping it's visible. So we are at the U-Boot A53 console. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, fetch the remote processor binary. So I'll be running Sephir on the left side, that's the A53 uh, application con uh, 
uh, processor console and on the right side the console is empty it's the console from the uh, m4 mcu cores so i'm fetching the binaries from uh, uh, over the network so i'm just doing so uh, uboot has a uh, command line interface where you can uh, do help uh, some uh, remote processor function so i'm just listing down and it listed that there is an m4 uh, mcu application <coughs> mcu core so I just oh, so we looked at the sequence of functions. So we stopped the core. So we prepared it for loading. Uh, we fetched the image, and uh, we fetched two. We are fetching two images. The first image is for running on the M4 core. The second one is for running on the F3 core. So I am starting the remote core. You can see that the, the uh, Hello World application with the console. Uh, shell access has booted up on the right side console which is run on the which is the m4 mcu core and on the left side you can see that sephir is running on the uh, a53 application core as well so this is what we can do today with linux uh, no, sorry u boot so now let's look at the i showed you how the api for sephir was implemented and we'll look at how the same thing happens uh, okay okay uh, so so right now what i'm doing is i won't be running any remote pro commands from uboot i'll be uh, just fetching the firmwares and just using the remote pro commands to boot software on the a53 application core the the software application on the a53 core will read the binary and go and load the m4 m uh, oh, sorry <coughs> so i am just fetching the binaries so we need to get two binaries because for first one we are running on the application a a53 core and the other one you are running on the m4 core so earlier I had run, so you can see how fast that the M4 core start, start up uh, from the applications because you are not booting sequentially from the uh, U-boot, but we are run, uh, starting it from Sephir. So the Sephir has booted up the uh, from the, the core. So I have some debug log. So first thing we are doing in this application is, I told you there is, there is a system controller that we need to negotiate with to do research powers and all. So first we are uh, talking with the system controller and printing out the version. Now then we are requesting the handle processor handle, powering up the processor, and uh, uh, putting it to reset. Then do the elf loader, do the uh, load the elf sections, and then re release the processor from reset and the uh, the example runs on the M4. So coming to the open items and future plans, so, so this is just a proof of concept we have and uh, we'll be working on an RFC pull request and describing on what, what the benefits are and we need to add test cases and we need to do it uh, present in the development review for uh, getting a new subsystem and uh, we are also exploring on how we can optimize and improve the client implementation to do things like graceful shutdown and uh, resource uh, requesting and negotiating resource to the host and also we what we would like to really explore is how can we have mc boot as a uh, standard very light bootloader for uh, a complex heterogeneous system uh, like those devices you saw in the before and now i'm using the elf helpers from the uh, llext implementation so i talked with few people from the openam and uh, they told that there are already implementations and elf helpers there so we'll be exploring if we can reuse them as well so now the elf loader was written from scratch taking inspiration from the implementation linux so most of the implementation we took from was linux and the open is the governing project that provides the guidelines for the remote processor framework and all So we got into the discussion of this framework when we tried to add support for one of the platforms and we were reproducing existing linger commands and code and that Carlo was the person who suggested uh, if it might help uh, if we have something like this. So these are my contact details and I'm available for any questions if you have.
So if I got this correct, you start the first Zephyr. Yeah. And then second Zephyr has, uh, the first Zephyr has an application yes. that starts the second one. Correct, yes, correct. And how does first Zephyr know where is the, the image for the second So one? right now I am just hard coding those, so we can have it help us to read it from Flash or we can oh, okay. have it in device tree. Usually from a, in a bootloader's perspective, it will be in the boot medium, maybe an SD card or Flash memory. Okay. So in the, this implementation, what I'm doing is I'm loading it to the DDR from U-Boot, and I'm just reading it in my okay. application. Very so, good talk. Very yeah, good. yeah, thank you. So I believe on these processors, TI has some clocking firmware yes. um, that needs to run it. Uh, I don't the, I'm not sure what the name is, right? But there's some something you need to do to be able to service yeah. um, the, the clock tree structure to turn clocks on and off. So yes. is that a, an object file that you're linking into the Zephyr image, or so, does that exist somewhere so else when I'm you're running doing on the now, M4? So when, when we go and do the MCU boot path where we want to have the MCU boot as a bootloader, at that time, we'll need to think about loading this firmware. So what I'm doing is I'm starting from a... I'm, uh, from a, the U-Boot console where all of these, uh, uh, the device manager firmware, the security firmware is already loaded. So when we do take the, we want to have the MC boot as a bootloader, we need to have a way to have slots and load all these uh, firmwares to the remote processors. So again, how U-Boot does is that is also through the remote process framework. So if you look at the system controller or the security, con the security controller is, uh, the firmware is usually loaded by the ROM and the power management, the clock management, the device manager firmware is loaded from the U-boot. And it, on this device, it's a Cortex-R5 core. And that's also being loaded through the remote processor framework in U-boot. Uh, so if you have a framework in Zephyr, so you can either pack uh, the binaries like U-Boot does, or maybe have slots in, uh, additional slots in the MCU boot, uh, the, the flash layout, and pick the firmware from there. We have not explored something like that, but if you need to have a standalone bootloader, we need to do something like that. Since I used U-Boot, it's all of those are loaded uh, by U-Boot already. Do you have a real use case in mind with that or just exploring for now? So we are exploring. So we are real use cases in our SDKs with the different Atlas. So oh, we are okay. trying to achieve something similar here. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining.